It was a cold, still morning at Whitehall on January the 30th, 1649, as Charles I, King of Great Britain, was led to the chopping block. There, he faced a crowd of his subjects and gave a lengthy speech, which went largely unheard by them because of their distance from the scaffold. But one sentence following that speech said in passing to a friend, would live on forever in the minds of the English. I go now from a corruptible to an incorruptible crowd. Then Charles I laid his head upon the block, gave a short prayer, and flattened his hands as a signal. In one stroke, he was beheaded, signaling the end of not only his reign, but of some of the most devastating wars in the history of England. And as he gave the signal to die, he knew that his power would pass not to his legal heir, but to another man, the true ruler of England, Oliver Cromwell, the commander of the rebel forces and the ultimate victor of the English Civil Wars. Unlike many of my fellow gruff boy southern men, I deeply love to learn about our world's entire history, from as close as the fields of Gettysburg to as far as the Straits of Myong Yang. There's nothing that can't give me that fire in the belly or that spark of imagination when hearing the perspective of a unique culture. But I would be stupid if I didn't understand that even as I'm reading a tale as ancient as India's Mahabharata or as alien as China's journey to the West, it's all coming to me filtered through a European perspective. And from all my time learning world history, I've come to find that there is no perspective more pervasive, more wide-reaching than that of the British Empire. At their height, the sun truly never set upon them and they staked their claim on every continent in the world, no matter the weather, no matter the people, and no matter the means. But everyone's got to start somewhere, and there was, in fact, a time before Britain ruled the waves, before even they could effectively rule themselves, a time when things still needed to be hashed out, when foundations still needed to be laid, when the shift from disparate kingdoms to a full-fledged empire was still being made. And there was no period more influential to this great shift than the period in which this movie is set, Oliver Cromwell's day. But unfortunately, through shoddy writing, horrific acting, and a horrible misuse of its truly cinematic real-world events, this film fails to make you feel the importance of its era which to me is the worst thing any historical story can do. Make me not care about its history. That's why I'm making this video, to put this movie through the ringer, to explain why and how it failed horribly, and above all else, I'm gonna do what the film didn't. Make its history matter to everyone. Because like all the world's history, it does matter even to a gruff boy southern man like me. So, without further ado, this is the history behind Cromwell. Our story begins in 1625 when King James I, the first king to rule over a united England, Scotland, and Ireland, died, making his son Charles king. Along with becoming only the second man to rule over a united Great Britain, King Charles I also inherited a host of problems. His father wasn't exactly a tactful ruler. He believed in the divine right of kings and viewed Parliament as nothing but a tool to make money and to be disbanded at his leisure. 
Outside of the obvious political tension that created, religious tension had also reached an all-time high, with events such as Guy Fawkes' gunpowder plot fanning the flames of hatred. It didn't help either that King James authorized the creation of the King James Bible, an easily printable English translation that rocked the foundations of Christianity and further divided his nation. But still, through all his shortcomings, King James still maintained an air of quiet genius, a dedication to peace, and an open mind, which allowed him to maintain his nation's stability. But when he died in 1625, a man took the throne that had none of his positives and all of his negatives plus many more. King Charles I's reign seemed destined to fail, since not even a month after King James had died, he married Henrietta Maria, a French Catholic. And when it came time for his coronation ceremony, she publicly refused to attend because of religious differences. After that mistake, he immediately set about making another by joining the Thirty Years' War which resulted in a horrible defeat against Spain. After that mistake and the disgrace it brought him, particularly among the parliamentarians, he made another dissolving parliament. But since it was the role of parliament to collect taxes, he needed money. So he made his next big mistake by extending the law of ship money, which was a tax on coastal towns to fund the creation of new ships and forts to inland towns as well. But, apparently, wanting to outdo himself and how much he could make his nation hate him, he made the single worst mistake of his entire reign. In an attempt to unify the kingdoms under a single church, the Church of England, he began by reforming religion in Scotland. This was through the use of the Book of Common Prayer, which basically outlined how and why people should worship God. As you would guess, when it was forced into Scottish churches and temples, which were deeply opposed to it, it didn't go over well. In fact, it went over so badly that it sparked the beginning of the Bishops' Wars between England and Scotland. They were a disaster for Charles when his ill-equipped, untrained troops were obliterated by the Scottish force. Deeply humiliated and desperate for money, Charles reinstated Parliament, dissolved Parliament, then finally, realizing how close he was to defeat, reinstated them once more. This Parliament would come to be known as the Long Parliament, since its members passed laws to make sure that they could never be dissolved again. And little did Charles know, as he called this Parliament on November the 3rd, 1640, there sat in attendance was the man who would one day have his head. Is that him? Yes. Oliver! <laughs> The film begins just before the Long Parliament is called in 1640. Here we see Oliver Cromwell, played by Richard Harris, at his home, packing his things to leave for America. And it's here, not even 10 minutes into the film, that things already start to get problematic. Aside from the obvious inaccuracy of him packing to leave for America, he also has some odd things to say about the current political situation in England. I am leaving, sir, because we have a king who taxes the rich beyond its means and steals the land from the poor to maintain his lavish court and his Catholic wife. You see, immediately, 
The film is trying to set in your head the idea that Oliver Cromwell fought for the rights of the people, for freedom of speech, for democracy, that he's a hero fighting against a corrupt system and sacrificing everything for England. And the following scenes serve to strengthen this, like when land is being forcefully enclosed from the commons and made private, or when a man's ear is cut off for sedition, or way later in the film, when Cromwell's son dies after the Battle of Naseby. It's clear that the filmmakers wanted to paint Cromwell as a reluctant hero, and King Charles as a heartless villain, and they're prepared to use every cheap trick in the book to do it. But in reality, none of these things make sense when it comes to actual history. The only scene used to show the audience Cromwell's plight that actually makes sense historically is this scene. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Who has done this? Answer me, who has done this? An edict, squire, from the archbishop himself and by order of the king. Has this king forgotten the reformation? Mr. Cromwell, away with this popish idolatry! Did the Lord not say unto Moses, Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image? Along with the Book of Prayer, King Charles also forced many other religious reforms onto the people of Britain to force them to be more Anglican, a form of Christianity which, though not technically Catholic, kept many of its customs. So to Puritans like Cromwell, pretty much was Catholicism, which meant Charles was the enemy. That's why he fought. Oliver Cromwell was a farmer, blessed with high status, but cursed with bad land and little money. Because of this, he became horribly depressed, turning to religious fanaticism for solace. He fought because he believed it was his calling to fight, for his version of Christianity, without which he felt he had nothing to live for. So why don't the filmmakers allow us to see this? To show us Oliver Cromwell how he was historically, warts and all, without using cheap tricks to make us root for him? Why not allow Richard Harris's performance to dictate how we feel about his character? Well, I think I know why because Richard Harris is a terrible actor. It seems like all he can do is chew the scenery instead of giving Cromwell the relatable, realistic humanity he deserves. It doesn't help either that King Charles I is played by none other than Sir Alec Guinness, a titan of the silver screen who completely embodies every role he takes. His King Charles is like history brought to life. In some scenes, he stutters as King Charles stuttered. You may be assured I do not intend now to be schooled in my high office by illiterate farmhands, cobblers, and basket weavers. And in another, he loses his English accent and reverts to his native Scottish when angry. Do not rise, sir, when your king approaches. Right, sir. Or to your knees in shape. But it's not just the little things. He gives a palpable, deeply human performance that, over the course of the film, makes you start to root for him, despite the filmmaker's best efforts against it. So much so, that by the film's end, when he's led to the scaffold, it feels like an injustice. But we're not there yet. On November the 3rd, the Long Parliament is finally called, but almost immediately talks break down. Fed up with being nothing more than just a source of money for their king, Parliament decides that they will only collect taxes for King Charles' war against the Scots if he relinquishes all authority over them. Of course, this proposition is met with a resounding no from the Royalists, with one of Charles' advisors, Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Strafford, even going so far as to suggest that the men who ordered the proposal be executed, which King Charles agrees with, writing a warrant for their arrests. 
But before anything can be put into action, Parliament finds out, giving them rightful cause to have the Earl of Strafford tried for treason and beheaded. Or at least, that's how it goes in the movie. In reality, this was just another trick used by the filmmakers to make Cromwell and Parliament look like heroes. What actually happened is far less heroic. After the proposal was made, all Strafford did was speak out against them, exercising his freedom of speech to denounce a decision he disagreed with. This angered the parliamentarians, leading them to, pretty much, do exactly what Charles orders in the movie. They arrested Strafford, and knowing they didn't have enough evidence to actually try him in a court of law, they passed a bill which made it possible to execute him without a trial. Pretty heroic, huh? But either way, Strafford is dead, leaving King Charles without an important political ally and friend. He's backed into a corner, so he makes probably the single worst mistake of his entire reign. He gathers a force of arms and storms Parliament to seize Strafford's killers. This one moment, compounded with everything else Charles had done, was the final push towards civil war. By October 23rd, 1642, both sides finally met in pitched battle. Before, the war's action was made up of only small skirmishes, ambushes, and sieges. But now, both armies had finally amassed near Edge Hill, Warwickshire, prepared to fight to decide which cause was truly righteous beneath the eyes of God. You see, the first battle in any war, especially a civil war, sets the tone for the events to come. It influences the steps that will be taken by both sides and the pace at which the war will move. Take the first battle of Bull Run as an example. And the real battle of Hedge Hill was no different. In fact, it perfectly set the tone for the future of the conflict. As the opening cannonades fired and both sides, foot and horse, crashed into each other, it became immediately clear that this battle wouldn't be a short one. Minutes turned to hours, and both armies fought savagely to give everything they got. Knights clashed with knights, footmen with footmen, muskets flared and cries rang out. In one place, a parliamentarian brigade gave way beneath a cavalry charge led by Prince Rupert, nephew of King Charles which allowed them to strike behind the rebels at their baggage train. But though that might seem a heavy blow to parliamentarian morale, they were still able to strike back at the royalists. Sounding a charge, the rebels crashed into the center of King Charles's line. A crushing blow, which knifed through the royalist army, allowing the parliamentarians to capture the royalist standard and thereby cripple the royalist morale. With both armies' morale running low, from that point on it became less of a battle and more of a savage contest of wills. And as those wills were slowly broken, both sides retreated from the field, leaving the battle a draw. And upon that draw was where the tone of this war was set. Only by its end would its outcome truly be known. But in the film's depiction of the battle, you get none of that. Instead, a line of shining royalists bearing colorful standards easily defeat the ragtag parliamentarian force, leaving Oliver Cromwell with no choice but to create his own. And by doing this, the filmmakers made what I believe to be the single biggest mistake of the entire film. Because in order to make the parliamentarians look like heroic rebels fighting against an evil empire, they outright ignored English history. What if I told you that when both armies met at Edgehill, 
it was because King Charles had been marching south to reclaim London. Yeah, when you learn the history of the English Civil War, it's best to throw out every preconceived notion you might have of what it looks like to be a rebel against an empire. Because since the parliamentarians had London, they held more political and economic power than their king. So, when they entered the Battle of Edgehill, they were better equipped and supplied than their royalist enemies, making the entire next scene where Oliver Cromwell spends three years raising a force from nothing utterly pointless, completely historically inaccurate, and ultimately disastrous for the film. You see, the most exciting parts of conflict, be it national, personal, or otherwise, are not the beginning and the end, but the middle, the back and forth, push and pull, the tug of war. That's what conflict is. And it's the reason we as a society love to learn about war. But the filmmakers ignored this fact, skipping three whole years of important history to show us only the first and last battles of the war. Now, defenders of this film would point out that budgetary constraints are the reason we're not shown more. But that just makes me wonder, how difficult could it have been for the filmmakers to do what I'm doing now? Put in a scene where we're told the numerous important events of the war that happened within these three skipped years. Show us map graphics, demonstrate the push and pull, and above all, write it in a way that makes us care about the history. Then, have a posh Englishman narrate it. I can think of one. But no, it's all skipped for a training montage, which to their credit is actually based on real history. In 1645, a new army was forged from a merger of three existing armies and was given the newest tactics, the best officers, and the highest quality arms and equipment. This new model army, as it was called, was the foundation of Britain's future military might. But they weren't dressed in black and yellow like were shown in the movie, but instead they wore the first iteration of the iconic red coat. The first order for this army of redcoats was to besiege Oxford, King Charles's capital. But because of the parliamentarian loss at Leicester, they were forced to march north to meet the royalist army head on. And so began the final battle of the war, the Battle of Naseby. Which is, as you would expect, incredibly historically inaccurate. In fact, it's so historically inaccurate that it makes the movie's Battle of Edge Hill look like a documentary in comparison. I mean, before the battle even begins, we're told a lie which, for obvious reasons, is used to make the parliamentarians look like the underdogs. I don't speak, man. They're about six miles away, Your Majesty, just south of Naseby. By my reckoning, there be about a thousand horse and two thousand afoot. And what news of Manchester's army? I saw no other army, Your Majesty. Was not Cromwell to join with Manchester's forces at, at Naseby? That was our intelligence, Your Majesty. Then Manchester be still in Lincoln. So? Cromwell comes with his army of 3,000 to our 7,000. By your leave, Uncle. Your Highness. General Ashley, sign the alert, Prince sir. Cavalier. On every man in full Prince battle order at once. Sir. My God, we have him. That statement right there is so wrong that it flips the entire battle on its head. You see, in reality, it was actually the parliamentarians that outnumbered the royalist force, nearly two to one, boasting 14,000 men against King Charles' 7,400. So when we see the army of swaggering royalists defeated by their own hubris and the sheer willpower of the heroic parliamentarian army, we're basically watching a fantasy film because it was the royalists who were the actual underdogs, fighting to the last against an overwhelming enemy force and knowing full well that if they lost there, the entire war was lost. 
So when these men were defeated, they weren't bested by the power of God, or democracy, or justice, or whatever else this movie wants to claim. No, they were defeated because of many factors in a multi-layered conflict. Factors that the filmmakers deliberately kept out of their film because it didn't fit their agenda. As much as I've lampooned this film so far, a lot of its second half is actually pretty good. Because since the parliamentarians have won, the filmmakers don't really have any more tricks up their sleeve to make them look like the good guys. Now it's all left up to the quality of the actors to make the audience care. So we're shown Cromwell and Parliament's empty theatrics. They howl and bluster and flip their opinions on a dime based on whatever schlub gives an epic speech, giving you the idea that they'd be better off acting in a stage play than a feature-length film. Meanwhile, Sir Alec Guinness's King Charles is pressed on all sides by his opponents, his advisors, and his wife. He's backed against a corner and truly scared for his future. So. He does the medium of film justice by giving a measured performance that subtly shifts from quietly stoic to deeply hurt and terrified. Remember earlier when I said you begin to root for Charles despite the best efforts of the filmmakers? Well, that is the reason why, as well as the fact that from here on out, the actions of Oliver Cromwell are too morally wrong to be made righteous. And this King Charles is too human to be made a villain. In fact, the only thing that King Charles does that could be considered bad in the latter half of the film is negotiate with an Irish Catholic bishop for more troops to win the war. But in order to find this evil, you'd have to have the same anti-Catholic views as the filmmakers. But I don't care either way. It's all Christianity in the end, so it's just Odd to me that this simple agreement is framed as a deal with Satan. Catholics as allies! It is unthinkable! My God, if it's come to this, let us rather sue for an honorable peace than fight a dishonorable war! I will not countenance defeat. Rather than abandon my kingdom to Parliament, I would come to terms with the devil himself. Meanwhile, our film's hero is doing things everyone can disagree with, like strong-arming Parliament with soldiers because they voted differently than him, which, as you could recall, is pretty much the entire reason for the start of the war they just fought, or having a soldier hang because he spoke out against decisions made by his superiors, like what Cromwell has been doing the entire movie, or saying stuff like this. Has Parliament approved this treaty? Parliament no longer truly represents the people of this nation, Sir Edward. And you, Mr. Cromwell, do you truly represent the people of this nation? I represent the army, sir. And the army is the heart and conscience of the people. So, having failed to come to terms with Parliament, you would now negotiate with the King. I am not bound to negotiate with anyone. With 50,000 men under my command, I could impose a government on this nation overnight. Compare this to what was shown of King Charles, him playing blind man's bluff with his children, or saying a wistful goodbye to his heir and his wife, or later, him telling his young children that he will soon be executed. Speaking of his execution, it's about that time. Following the Second English Civil War, which lasted from February to August 1648, which the film doesn't even bother to mention, 
Charles was put on trial for high treason. It was a kangaroo court, which both the real Charles and his movie depiction show a clear disdain for. Refusing even to give a plea, inciting their divine right to rule and not to be judged by their subjects. But that didn't stop the proceedings. After Charles was taken from the hall, the judges met, and there both the real Cromwell and his movie counterpart practically forced many of them to sign their king's death warrant. Sign it. Olive, I cannot. Is he guilty or not guilty? He is the king. Is he guilty? Yes. Sign it. And so, after a tearful goodbye to his children, King Charles is led to his execution ceremony. And after the axe drops, there dies the emotional heart of this film and the last shred of my interest. Every scene after this feels like pulling teeth because they contain the most disgusting lies of the entire film. Like in this scene, when Cromwell's allies ask him to take Charles's place as king, and this is his reaction. Did we cut the head off this king only to steal his crown? This hollow golden ring, this worthless trinket? Give it to a whore for the price of her bed! In reality, the only reason Oliver Cromwell didn't make himself king was because he would have had less power if he did so. You see, since he held full control over the new model army, he was able to storm Parliament and disband it, basically making himself a dictator that ruled Britain with absolute power. And if he had become king, he would have had to follow the same rules that King Charles had. Yeah, this was not a man to be praised or made a hero. In fact, I'd argue that based upon many of the actions were both shown and not shown, if there was any villain of this story, it was him. But that's all beyond the scope of this video. So for now, I'll leave you with this. I hereby move that this film be universally considered garbage. The motion has been proposed. Let it be put now to the question. Is the motion agreed? No! no, no, no. In favor of the motion? Aye! 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 The ayes have it. Hey, what's up, everyone? Sorry it took so long. I think I'm afflicted with historical ADD since I've spent the past few months bouncing around on a whole bunch of different scripts, on all sorts of different games and movies. With this video, I've got the train running again for my next video. A video on the history behind the entire Ezio Aldatore trilogy, which will be out by next month. See you then! When mighty roast beef was the Englishman's food, it ennobled our veins and enriched our blood. Our soldiers were brave and our courtiers were good. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. But since we have learned from all vaporing friends to eat their ragouts as well as to dance, we're fed up with nothing but vain complacence. Oh, the roast beef of old England, and old English roast beef. Our fathers of old were robust, out and strong, and kept open house with good cheer all day long, which made their plump tenants rejoice in this song. Oh, the roast beef of old England, and old English roast beef. When good Queen Elizabeth sat on the throne, ere coffee or tea or such slip-slops were known, the world was in terror if ever she did frown. 
Oh, the roast beef of old England, and old English roast beef. In those days, if fleets did presume on the main, they seldom or ever return back again, as witness the vaunting armada of Spain. Oh, the roast beef of old England, and old English roast beef.